غریب دیتے ہیں پرسا تمہارے پیاروں کا سلام تم پہ ہمارے رسول کے پیاروں We have two more nights to complete our afterlife journey and uh, what uh, I have decided to do is to somehow uh, discuss the concept of hell tonight. and then the concept of Laqa Allah and Paradise tomorrow night because that is of course the culmination of that journey and I think it's better to postpone it for the last night as uh, of course uh, you heard on the Ashura day uh, we will dedicate all our time to recite Maqtal which is I think the best thing we can do on the day of Ashura because it is recommended that on the day of Ashura the Shiites come together and remind each other and remember and recite the history which uh, uh, took place and uh, I think we better follow that recommendation and dedicate the whole Ashura lectures for reciting Maqtal and by reciting, by reciting Maqtal what I mean Maqtal is usually a book in which the story of Karbala is written and of course we have very reliable uh, books of Maqtal coming from the very first century Uh, which have recorded the story of Karbala and inshallah I will try to collect and gather the most reliable version of the story and uh, as much as two hours would allow inshallah we will go through the story from where Hussein salam approached Karbala until uh, the moment of Uh, his ascension to the Lord. Okay, now usually the most difficult part of life after death to discuss is the concept of hell. Why? Because it somehow contradicts with the concept of mercy of God that we have. If God is so merciful, why should he allow anyone enter hell? This is the first question. The second question, which is an ancient question, and even we had this question at the time of the prophet and imams, and we have some replies from them as well, is that okay, our sins, no matter how grave and how great, is limited, are limited. How many sins we commit in our lives? Say, one billion sins for example. But still it's a limited number and we commit them in a short time. Say, after we are mature, until we die, we have 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, if we are lucky, to live in this world. And in this limited period, we do lots of mistakes, we commit sins. Is it fair that eternally we will be punished for these sins? Why, for limited time of committing sins, we have to be punished forever. Is this fair or is not fair? I think to answer these questions we have to somehow correct our concept about the hell. Hell is not a place for Allah to revenge. 
The punishment in Nash'atul Akhirah is not like the punishment that we have in this world. We punish each other because we do wrong, we do wrong each other and we have to punish to stop repetition or to uh, restore justice. Allah can restore justice without punishment, couldn't He? He could restore justice without punishment. You say, okay, whatever belongs to Allah, Haqqullah, He can forgive, and He does. Whatever belongs to people, Haqqunnas, you have backbited people, you have uh, wronged people, you have disgraced people, and all these things, and unless they are happy with you, you cannot be forgiven. Allah does not forgive unless they forgive. But suppose you have done all these things to me, and worse than that. Suppose you have cut off one of my hands and plucked one of my eyes, and I wouldn't be pleased with you at all, and you have to be punished. How about if on the day of judgment Allah says, would you be satisfied if I give you hundred palaces in place of what they have done to you? You forgive them? I should be silly to say no. Or clever to say no, so that he says, okay, what about one thousand palaces? <laughs> okay. Well, he can satisfy me, couldn't he? He can satisfy me and he can satisfy you. And in this way, no one would be punished. No one would go to hell. Well, the whole problem is that it doesn't work like that. We should know where this whole approach, how we have to approach this concept to understand it. There is a very famous uh, uh, scholar and Arif, Mirza Jawad Maliki Tabrizi. Maybe some of you have heard of him. He was the teacher of akhlaq, of morals and ethics for many of great people like Imam Khomeini. He was his teacher. He's buried in Shaykhan Cemetery just uh, opposite the Ma'asum, Hazrat Ma'asum Haram in Qom. He has a book, al muraqabat In that book he writes, when he writes about mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, my Lord, my intellect cannot accept that you will take anyone to hell. Whatever you say in the Quran, I accept it because you say it. But I don't understand it. Because the way I know you, the way I know your mercy, I cannot imagine that someone would not qualify for your forgiveness and would eventually go to hell. But you know, Quran tells us many people eventually go to hell. Now, let's approach this from a different angle. What if hell is not created for human beings at all? Let's think this way. Shaitan is an evil creature. Evil creature in the sense that God has given him lots of power and he's using that power in a very bad way. Now, when he wanted to, Allah wanted to punish him in the sense to put a stop on his activity, he said, give me respite. Give me respite. How he wanted to put a stop on his activity, he wanted to take him to a place where he was busy only with himself and his punishment so that he could not do anything else to hell. He said, give me respite. Why you want respite? Because you are putting me in hell 
for the sake of these human beings. You told me prostrate to Adam, I didn't. And you want to put me to hell for that. But give me respite, I show you that most of these human beings would be like me, evil as I am. And then what you want to do? Is it fair you put me in hell for these creatures? For these nasty human beings that you have created? Is it fair? Now, good argument, isn't it? Although Shaitan is very silly, but very clever. Qala, <laughs> is in Surah Isra. Qala, ara'aytaka hadha alladhi karramta alayhi. لَإِنْ أَخَّرْتَنِ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ لَأَحْتَنِكَنَّ ذُرِّيَتَهُ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا What you say if you give me some respite? Until the day you want to judge them. At the beginning, Shaitan knew there would be death, there would be day of judgment and everything. Because he was a very knowledgeable creature. If you give me respite, you will see I will reign all of them, control them, and take them to the evil that I have been plagued with. What do you think Allah should say? No, this human being, although they might be evil, I prefer them over you? No. Go, oh, I give you respite, do whatever you can. فَمَنْ تَبَعَكَ مِنْهُمْ فَإِنَّ جَهَنَّمَ جَزَاؤُكُمْ جَزَاءً مَوْفُرًا Whoever follows you, comes with you to hell. There is no difference here between jinn and ins for me. No difference between human beings and you. Why are you driven from my mercy? Because you are evil. If they commit evil, they will be driven from my mercy as well. Now, consider the fact that Allah created us after his own image. What does it mean? We have this in Bible, we have this in our traditions. We have this indirectly in the Quran. Allah has created man after his own image. Now, if we are literalists, nasty type of uh, irrational people of tradition, we say, well, Allah is like a human being and has created us like himself. <coughs> now, that doesn't mean that. It means whatever power, whatever quality he has, he has endowed in us as well. Mercy, knowledge, power, all these things. But there is one thing above all these, and that is what? Free will. Had he given us all these things, but not given us free will, then we wouldn't have been created after his own image. He hasn't actually given us whatever quality he has. He's very generous, he's not like us. Very generous. Generously he has given to us. Now, when this issue of free will comes, then he either should leave us to do whatever we want, and even if we want to do evil, or he should stop us. If he stops us, it means what? It means he hasn't given us free will. If he leaves us, what we do? We go towards evil. Now, what should he do? At the end, at the end of it, what should he do? Okay, I know I have created so many human beings. I have created all of them for paradise. They should come to me. But I know some of them would deviate, would go towards evil. At the end, I separate those. And let them go where evil, the, the devil should go. And let them go there. And that's for a purpose, not for revenge. Who are we that Allah wants to take revenge from us? Do you take revenge from an ant? Nah, who are we? We are no one. We are nothing. 
We are not considered as anything so that Allah wants to take revenge. No. In Surah 8, verse 36, وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَىٰ جَهَنَّمَ يُحْشَرُونَ Those who reject will be driven together to hell. Why? ليميز الله الخبيث من الطيب That Allah might separate the impure from the good and put the impure, some of it upon the other and pile it up together then put it in the hell. Those are the losers. أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْخَاسِرُونَ Those are the losers. They have lost whatever we have given them. Even though they go to hell, even though they go to hell, however, the door of mercy is not closed on them, it's not shut off on them. This is one of the differences between Mu'tazili understanding of hereafter and Shi understanding. Mu'tazili says someone who commits a kabira will, be, will stay in hell forever. Our A'ima say no. If they change, if evil is separable from them. You remember last time we said, so long as evil could be washed away from our souls, Allah would wash it away with his mahfara and forgiveness. The only time a person would go to hell is when that evil is completely mixed with the soul, so that it could not be washed away. And therefore it should go to hell, to a process to cleanse and come out. But this cleansing and coming out, I bet you don't want to go through it. We never think about it. It's not something that a human being can ever imagine. In many places, after many, many, many centuries that these people stay in hell, they say, Rabbana akhrijna minha. Our Lord, let us out of this. If we come out and we repeat what we were doing, we are wrongdoers. Now Allah says they are liars. If I bring them out, now they say it, but if I, I bring them out, they go back to what they were doing. That means evil is not still separated, cleansed from their souls. And that means as soon as that evil is taken away from a soul, the soul would come out. But for some souls, it takes ages for some souls, like Iblis, it takes eternity, forever. He never ever comes out. Because the arrogance has made him evil. There's a story which consumes probably three minutes of my time, but I choose to mention it because it's very beautiful. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Barnabas that once Isa alayhi salam whispers to the Lord that my Lord is it not possible that you forgive Shaitan, forgive Iblis and let him prosper and come back to his place of closeness to you. We know he was very close to God. And then the people are relieved from his deceits, from his deception. Allah says, yes, of course it's possible. Isa alayhi salam says, how? How is it possible? He says, just comes and tells me with a broken heart that my God, I, make a mis I made a mistake. Let me go back. Jesus says, is that the only condition? Allah said, yes. Jesus becomes very happy. He says, can you arrange that I meet Iblis and I give this good news to him? Allah says, okay, I arrange that, go to such and such place. It's a very long story in that gospel. 
go to such and such place and uh, you will meet him and you can put the suggestion to him. He goes and he meets Iblis and there is long discussion between them, Iblis all the time ridiculing Isa salam, for what he does and what he believes. At the end Isa says, look I have not come here to argue with you. I've just come here to give you a good news. Do you like to go back to your original position, get release from pain and punishment of Allah? He said, yes, of course I do. He said, well, I have made it for you. I have asked Allah, he has agreed. You just say, my Lord, I made a mistake, forgive me. And he will take you back. Iblis thinks for a while and he says, good deal, but bad condition. He says, what condition? He said, the condition should be that Allah tells me I made a mistake and forgive me, then I go back. Now, this type of soul is completely destroyed, completely destroyed. It needs that torture and torment of hell to bring it back from where it is lost to see the glory and the might of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to leave the arrogance. And hell is a place where you lose your arrogance. Alaysa fi jahannam maswan lil mutakabbirin is not hell a place for the arrogant to crush their arrogance. Now when we discuss about the hell, you would see that it is a place where it crushes people's arrogance. But those who go there are so arrogant that for many, many, many hundreds of years that arrogance wouldn't go away. But as soon as it goes away, they come out. Why tomorrow night we discuss Arrogance could not be let could not be let into paradise because then the paradise would become hell. Suppose an arrogant person goes to paradise with all those abundance and power and whatever they wish. What happens? The first thing he does, he just kills everyone in paradise, isn't it? To have it for himself. Now we, you cannot have these things there. When we, when we analyze what type of place is paradise, you should be godlike to be letting. Otherwise it's impossible. Now, before people are taken to hell, after all the judgments and everything are made, there is a final appeal and a final chance. Both are mentioned in the Quran. The day when the enemies of God are marched out towards the fire of hell. And they shall be held in check. Then they start to complain. We didn't do what you say. Now, in, everyone has witnessed against them. The prophets, the witnesses, Allah himself, the earth on which they committed sins, everything. Still when they come to go, they deny. They say, we didn't do it. Hatta. Okay, you didn't do it. Let me bring you another witness. Hatta idha ma jauha shahida alayhim sam'uhum. وَأَبْصَارُهُمْ وَجُلُودُهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ When they come to it, their hearing will bear witness against them and their sight and their skins concerning what they did. Now they cannot stop it. Their hands start to speak. Their eyes start to speak against them. Don't say how. This is the Nash'atul Akhirah. This is not Nash'atul Dunya anymore. Everything is possible there. 
we were in wombs of our mothers if someone told us that when you go to the next world you eat a bread twice your 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 height twice your height did we believe it now we are eating much more than that isn't it no it's possible we don't know what's going on in Nash'atul Akhra. This is one place where they deny and a, another witness comes forth. The other one is that there is a final check on the door, on the gates of the hell. That's Kullama ulqiya fiha fawjun, Surah Mulk. Verse, verses 8 to 9. Alam nazir. Whenever a group is thrown in it, its keepers will ask them, Did there not come to you anyone to warn you? Didn't the Prophet come to you? Didn't you hear about the Prophet? Didn't you hear about a book? Now, if they say no, and they are truthful, if they live in a faraway island, they haven't heard anything about these issues, they'll be returned. These are not qualified for hell. No warning had come to them. But, unfortunately, of course, Allah doesn't make a mistake. He never sends these people there. So, everyone who goes there, قَالُوا بَلَا قَدْ جَاءَنَا نَذِيرٌ فَكَذَّبْنَا they will say, yes, a warner certainly came to us, but we impugned him and said, Allah did not send down anything, you are only in great error. We told them, you are liars, you are mad. These are myths of the past, and all these things we told them. And then when this final question is made, So enter now the gates of the hell. Now what type of place is hell? What type of place is hell? I have a topic here, what makes people to deserve hell? Let's just omit this one. It's very interesting. But uh, when we go through it you will see that most of people are not qualified to go to hell. This is for real evil people, for real evil people. Those for whom there is no remedy. We can see real evil people around us, isn't it? They murder, they rape, they plunder and all these things. Real evil people. Now, in hell as in paradise, since we are body and soul, we have a physical life, we have a spiritual and a psychological life, as in paradise. You know, human being is made of body and soul, and this is going to, to be with him forever. It's not that our souls would go and could live without bodies in paradise. And this gives us an advantage over all other creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Over angels. Angels, they are pure souls. They don't have bodies. Now of course they are much better than us. Their nourishment is praise of Allah, they are close to Him, they have great knowledge of Allah. But as Allah mentions, quoting them in the Quran, they say, وَمَا مِنَّا إِلَّا لَهُ مَقَامُ الْمَعْلُومُ Any one of us has a set position, we cannot exceed that position. Jibreel has a set position, Mikael has a set position, in this world and in the next world. Why? Because they are pure souls. Human beings, because we are soul and body, our souls have the flexibility of making this body a springboard and moving higher and higher and higher. And that's why when we go in paradise, we just surpass the position of angels. 
could go higher. As our prophet, we believe in this world, he surpassed the position of Jibreel, for example. So, it's not a disadvantage to have body. We shouldn't think that this body is worldly, is material, we have to drop it and go and join, unite with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't know what does this mean. Sometimes people say this. There's no meaning for it. Allah does not unite when it's with anything. Allah is as it was, as he will be. There's no change in him. It's us who move. Now, in hell we have a physical life. What is that physical life? First of all, the environment of hell. It's a dark, barren plateau with ups and downs, with dark valleys, with a very, very bad weather. Bad weather. A weather you would not like to ever experience. Now, in Surah Waqa'ah, wa ashabu shamal Ma ashabu shamal Fi samoomin wa hamim wa dhillin min yahmoom La baridin wa la kareem Those of the left hand, how wretched are those of the left hand? In hot wind, samoom, those winds which penetrated under skin, under the skin, the heat of it, and burns people from inside the skin. This was one type of wind coming in Arabia especially. This is the type of weather. And you can't find cold water. It's all the springs of hot, stinky water there you can find. And is there shadow? Is it all sun and heat or there is shadow? There is shadow there. Yeah, there is shadow. But that shadow is a dhil. A dhil is shadow, isn't it? This shadow, this shade is shade of a black smoke which covers the whole environment of the hell, making it a very grim place. Well, usually you expect shade to give you some benefit. But here Allah says, La baridin wa la kareem. There is neither coolness in this shade, nor there is any benefit in it. But it makes the whole environment gloomy. Now, psychologically, if you live in such a place, what type of attitude you will have? And this is why they all the time ask these angels who come and go and punish that couldn't your Lord finish our lives? But the unfortunate thing is that there is no death anymore. As, as we said in Nash'atul Akhirah, the life finishes the concept of death. وَقَالُوا يَا Malik. Malik is the big chief of the manager of Jahannam. As Razwan is the manager of paradise, the chief angel, Malik is manager of hell. وَقَالُوا يَا Malik, لِيَقْضِ عَلَيْنَا رَبُّكْ Malik, ask your Lord to finish us off. قَالَ إِنَّكُمْ مَاكِثُونَ He says, there's no death, sorry. No death anymore. And sometimes they turn to the angels, to the smaller angels, they talk to them, they beseech them. That ask your Lord to give us one day respite of all this. And they say, didn't a warner come to you to warn you? So you have to go through it. Now, it's not only that Noise-wise, it's very polluted as well. People cannot hear each other. This constant noise of fire burning somewhere, 
fills the ears. وَلِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ Again Surah Mulk. عَذَابُ جَهَنَّمَ وَبِئْسَ الْمَسِيرِ And for those who reject their Lord is the punishment of hell and evil is that resort. إِذَا أُلْقُوا فِيهَا سَمِعُوا لَهَا شَحِيقًا وَهِيَ تَفُورٌ When they shall be cast therein, they shall hear a loud moaning of it as it heaves, almost bursting for fury. This is how they hear the surroundings. And when they want to speak to each other, they have to shout. Well, naturally, always they shout at each other. And they fight each other, but even if they want to speak, ordinarily they have to shout. Imagine what type of environment is that? Bal but they reject the hour. This is in Surah Furqan. And we have prepared a burning fire for him who rejects the hour. When it shall come into their sight from a distant place, they shall hear his vehement raging and roaring. And when they are cast into a narrow place in it bound, they shall there call out for destruction. Oh God, kill us. Please kill us. Please finish us. Call not this day for one destruction. Call every moment for destruction. It's not going to avail you. Why? Because we want to crush your arrogance. But amazingly, this arrogance is not crushed easily. Now, there they need a cloth. They need to wear something. They don't want to go naked here and there. In paradise, of course, we will discuss what type of clothing they are. Paradise is a place of abundance. Abundance, extravagance. Here, of course, is different. فَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا قُطْعَتْ لَهُمْ ثِيَابٌ مِنْ نَارٍ Then as to those who disbelieve, for them are cut out garments of fire. Of course, it's not fire. It's a, it's a tar-like thing, which when they, are, they cover themselves with it, that samum, that hot wind goes through it and makes the whole body to become fiery. And that is, of course, a garment cut out of fire. They have physical punishment. Apart from this environment, they have fits of punishment, fits of going into cells of torturing those angels who come and visit them. You see, we don't know how it's going to be. It's, it's a life. It's a life. For us now, we have bits and pieces we put together and we want to explain it. But it's a life they are having it there. It becomes very natural, very routine for them, all these things. But very unbearable, intolerable. They need food. They have bodies. They need food. What can they find to eat? Okay, this is a barren land. Few plants would ever grow on that. Has not there come to you the news of the overwhelming calamity? Some faces on that day shall be downcast, laboring, toiling, entering into burning fire, made to drink from a boiling spring, because they become thirsty. They have to drink something. And they have to drink from that boiling spring. They shall have no food but of thorns. Laysa lahum ta'amun illa min dari. There are some thorns growing here and there. They, when they are let off to go and find food, as Amirul Mu'mineen mentions in one of his 
sermons, if you could imagine when these people are let off to go for food and they rush into the plain lands to find something to eat and they find these thorns, thorny plants and they eat it. They eat, they never get satiated, they never get filled up which will neither fatten nor avail against hunger. This is one type of food. There's another type of food, maybe at different levels of hell. There's a tree mentioned many times in the Quran, which is a tree having fruits so ugly that you would not like to look at them. The blooms of it is like heads of devil that, that that's the, 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 the most ugly thing with which something was described this is called shajaratul zaqum the tree of zaqum inna shajarat zaqum ta'amul athim the tree of zaqum is the food of the sinful like dregs of oil, it shall boil in their bellies when they eat it. Like the boiling of hot water. And then after they eat it, they need water. They become very thirsty. They rush for water. There's nothing there but boiling water, but hot, stinky water. And they go, no one forces them to go and drink from that water. They go and drink like thirsty camels. ثُمَّ إِنَّكُمْ سُورَ وَاغَأَ أَيُّهَا الدَّالُونَ الْمُكَذِّبُونَ لَآكَلُونَ مِنْ شَجَرٍ مِنْ زَقُّونَ Then shall you owe you who err and call it a lie. Most surely eat, you will eat of a tree of zakum and fill your bellies with it because you are hungry. Then drink over it of boiling water and drink as drinks the thirsty camel. You compete each other, you contest each other to go and get some of that water. This is their entertainment on the day of requital. Okay, enough of these physical things. We can go on. It's really not tolerable to hear. Now, psychologically, how these people would look. I mean, you can imagine. They have problem with their food. They have problem with their water. They have problem with their companies. They have problem with their residence. They have fits of torture and torment. And what else? They regard, some, some of them regard others to be instrumental for bringing, to hell, for, for bringing them to hell. Now this is the most difficult thing. You have to be company of someone whom you think all your predicament is because of them. They deceived you. They brought you here. And now you are with them. And that's why all the time when they see each other they fight with great sense of regret and remorse. قَدْ خَسَرَ الَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِلِقَاءِ اللَّهِ Surah An'am verse 31 They are losers indeed who reject the meeting of Allah until when the hour comes upon them all of a sudden they shall say Our oh Lord, O oh our grief for our neglecting it and they shall bear their burdens on their backs now surely evil is that which they bear with grief and regret And they all the time say, Oh Lord, those who made us to come here, those who play a, play a part in deceiving us, show them to us, we want to kill them. 
you want to beat them. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا رَبَّنَا أَرْنَ الَّذَيْنَ أَضَلَّانَا مِنَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسِ نَجْعَلْهُمَا تَحْتَ أَقْدَامِنَا لِيَكُونَا مِنَ الْأَسْفَلِينَ And those who disbelieve will say, Our Lord, show us those who led us astray from among the jinn and the men, that we may trample them under our feet, so that they may be of the lowest. In Surah Saad, it says, I just read the translation. This is an army plunging in harshly along with you. Two groups go together to hell. No welcome for them while they are going to start fighting with each other. Surely they shall enter fire. They shall say, nay, you know, welcome to you. You did prefer it to us, so evil is the resting place. At the end they shall say, our Lord, whoever prepared it first for us, add though to him a double chastisement in the fire. And of course, then they shall not see some people whom they regarded to be simple-minded, people who had believed in all those mythical things that prophets had said and they say, where are they? We do not see them. Yeah, of course they are in paradise now. And of course, there are many verses talking about this. The Allah says, despite all these, if I give them one moment of respite, they go back. They do not desist, they do not desist of, what they, of what they did. وَلَوْ تَرَى Again Surah Anna إِذْ بُقِفُوا عَلَى النَّارِ If, could you see when they are made to stand before the fire, then they shall say, would that we were sent back and we would not reject the communications of our Lord and we would be of the believers Nay, what they concealed before shall become manifest to them. And if they were sent back, they would certainly go back to that which they are forbidden. And most surely they are liars. As I said, as soon as this lying goes away, they come out. And they have a spiritual plague as well. They call upon God. God does not answer them. Because there's no answer in hell. There's no mercy in hell. First they have to correct themselves and come out. And then there would be a place for mercy. Now one other thing, one last thing I mentioned. And I finished this chapter. Of course, I really didn't go through the most gruesome parts of hell. Because we really cannot tolerate that. It's not good. Good to read and take heed, but not good to discuss very much. As I said, they have a lot of life there, and they are let off to go for food, to find food. And on some of those opportunities, they try to escape the hell. Now, how is it possible escaping the hell? They know it's not possible, but they have to try it. And when try, they try it, they are brought to a torture which would punish them because of that effort. Solitary cell. وَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فَسَقُوا فَمَعْوَاهُمُ النَّارِ And as for those who transgress their abode is the fire. كُلَّمَا أَرَادُوا أَنْ يَخْرُجُوا مِنْهَا أُعِيدُوا فِيهَا Whenever they desire to go forth from it, to escape from it, they shall be brought back into it. And it will be said to them, taste the chastisement of the fire, which you called a lie. Now, why they do this? Why, despite they know, and apparently they do it very frequently, despite they know they go, they are caught, they are brought, they are punished for what they do. 
because they are desperate. Because it's complete desperation there. As is mentioned in Surah Hajj, Kullama aradu an yakhruju minha min ghammin u'idu fiha. Whenever they will desire to escape from it out of grief and desperation, they shall be turned back into it. And they is the chastisement of burning. And at the end, hell is not just one place for one group of people. Laha sab'atu abwab in Surah Hijr. Laha sab'atu abwab likulli baabim minhum juz'um maqsum. It has seven gates. For every gate there shall be a separate party of them. Different levels for different evils. Now, who would go to such a place? How evil one should be that God would let them go inside this place? And that's why, as I said, as I quoted Imam Zain al Abidin salam opposing Hassan al Basri, he said, It's not amazing if people go to paradise, how they go to paradise. Because they are created for paradise, because Allah is merciful. It is amazing when people go to hell, how they make their way there. How is it possible for them to go there? Well, may God help us. May God help us from that. Okay, I finished this chapter. And inshallah, tomorrow night I will speak about better things. And things which are really related to our creation, rather than things which are a byproduct of our actions. This is not what we are created for. This is a byproduct of our actions. This is a byproduct of our free will that Allah has given us. So we leave that aside and we go a direct line to Laga Allah and then to paradise tomorrow, inshallah. Now, tonight, let me just speak a few minutes about this young man of the army of Hussein, Ali Akbar. His age is written differently from 18 years to 27 years or 28 years. And uh, whatever the case, he was one of the most prominent members of Hussein's family. On the morning of Ashura, the companions of Hussein salam, many of whom were old scholars and old dignified men of Kufa, they asked him, they had one request. In the, on the morning of Ashura, they had one request. They said, oh, the grandson of prophets, we have one request and we hope that you grant it to us. And that is, until we are alive, you do not let any of your family members go to fight. Because we are here to protect the family of the Prophet. And how it would be possible that until we are alive, we let family of the Prophet go and to the battlefield. So, they asked Hussein, they insisted, and the request was granted that they protect the family of the Prophet to the very last breath and then after they are down, after they are fallen, then of course it's Hussein and his family. Now after all companions were down, and they were not very great in number, about 50 people, after they were all down, the first man from Hussein's family who came asking him permission to go for single battle was Ali Akbar. Of course there was another son 
Ali ibn al Hussein Zain al Abidin alayhi salam, who was a bit older than Ali Akbar, most probably, but he was severely ill. He could not move from his tent. So he was the first man. And the reason he came first, because of course Hussein wanted his own son go first rather than sons of his brother or his cousins and these other people. And this son was a very spiritual man. We have a few anecdotes from him on the way. Of course, there are other anecdotes before in Medina, but on the way, one of these anecdotes which is reported by most of the historians is that on the way when Hussein was moving on his horse, he was just taken over by a very light sleep on his horse saddle. And suddenly he opened his eyes and said, Allahu Akbar. At that moment Ali Akbar was on his side. He said, Father, why did you say Allahu Akbar? What happened? He said, as I was in half asleep, I heard someone saying, these people are moving and death is moving with them. As if Hussein is telling, we are going towards our death. Ali Akbar said, Ya Abata, alasna ala al-haq. Are we not in the right? Hussein said, yes, I swear by God that we are in the right. Ali Akbar said, Idhan la nubali bil so why should we will be afraid of death. And of course this made Hussein very happy to see that this is the type of people coming along, not fearing anything. The only fear was that we are in the right, we are on the right direction. <coughs> it's interesting, the contrast of two young men, one was Qasim, son of Hassan ibn Ali, Hussein's nephew, and one Ali Akbar, his own son. It is reported that when Qasim came to ask permission from Hussein, Hussein hesitated. He did not give him permission to go and fight. And he said, you are the only thing left for me from my brother. How can I let you go? And they say that they hugged each other, they cried. But when Ali Akbar asked permission, Hussein just immediately said, Go, my son. And God knows how dear this Ali Akbar was for Hussein. How dear he was. Just said, Go. But after he turned back and moved towards the troops, all reporters of Karbala say that tears flew down Hussein's eyes. Looking to the sky, saying, My Lord, witness who's going to fight them now. Someone who is most similar to, his, to, the, to your Prophet in his talk and his walk and his, in his morals. And whenever we miss the Prophet and we wanted to show someone how Prophet was, we showed Ali Akbar to him. So similar he was to the Prophet. So he, he cried. And then he said, Yabna Sa'ad, he addressed Umar ibn Sa'ad, Qata Allahu Rahimak, Kama Qata Ata Rahimi. May God cut off your bonds as you have cut off my bonds. Now Ali Akbar went, Hussein is watching. It's very difficult for a father to, to watch when his son is in the battle being striked by swords and by spears. So he's watching. Ali Akbar was a brave man, of course he was 
grandson of Ali ibn Abi Talib and all these men coming from Ali ibn Abi Talib were very very brave and very strong so he fought very fiercefully and then Hussein surprisingly saw that he is breaking this circle of people surrounding him coming back to him something that Hussein didn't want to see he came back why did he come back? Because he thought he is losing energy and he wanted to fight to protect his father. So he came and said, Ya Abat al Atashu qad qatalani wa siqlu al hadith qad ashhadani fahal ila sharbatan min al ma'i sabil. The thirst is killing me and the weight of this armor is bringing me down. Is there just one sip of water so that I get energy and go back? <laughs> this is one of the places that the narrators of Karbala say we saw Hussein crying very visibly. He said, My son, go back, there is no water. Soon your grandfather Rasulullah will give you water and you will be satiated. And this was the last time when, of course, Hussein saw Ali Akbar alive. It didn't take long until Hussein saw Ali Akbar falling from the horse. So he just rushed towards him, clearing the area, putting the, everyone back, the army of the enemy and with Abbas and others protecting him, protecting him. He just came down and when he put Ali Akbar's head on his lap, he was already dead. And one thing he said, Ala dunya ba'daka al-afa May dust be on this world after you. Qatalallahu qawman Hussain, <laughs> जिसके भाई को जहर पिलाया गया जिसको बैठे बिठाए सताया गया उस हुसैन उस हुसैन उस हुसैन इब्ने